This evening we'll commence a, a review of the book of Philemon, the epistle to Philemon. There are six uh, letters in Scripture that are addressed to individuals. Rather unique circumstance. And yet the information they contain are not just for those individuals. They're for the entire household of faith. And this is something that's unique about the, about the Scriptures. Sometimes they're addressed to a particular a whole letters addressed to a particular person. They're generally not real lengthy, with, with two exceptions. But they contain one faith and one hope and the perspective of the kingdom that applies to everybody. They're, they're individual, but they're not individualized. And there's a distinct difference. These letters written to individuals, Luke, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, were written to Theophilus. Theophilus means friend of God. Phyllis, from Philadelphia, love. Theos, God. Quite a name, isn't it? Friend of God. I think I've heard that before. Friend of God. That's what Theophilus means. Abraham was called it because you know the friend of God. And then Paul wrote two letters to Timothy, one to Titus, and this letter to Philemon. Second John was written to the elect lady. She's she's unnamed. Third John is written to Gaius. To my knowledge, no other books of scripture were written to a sing to a person. There were some uh, letters written to individual churches, whole, a whole congregation. They include Romans and the Corinthians, the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. And then some were written to groups of churches, churches of Galatia. Galatia is written to a group of churches and the seven churches of Asia. See, so there's some showing you the different... <laughs> manner in which the scriptures addressed. Some were written to particular groups of people. The book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew, Hebrew believers. And the strangers were scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. For first and second Peter was written to them. See, it's a cluster of certain kind of people. James wrote to the 12 tribes that were scattered. Jude wrote to those who were sanctified by God, preserved in Christ Jesus, and called. And as is those that needed to be stirred up, or clustered, they were a, a particular body of people, but you can see it, just that body still exists. Yeah. Matthew wrote his gospel, it's understood primarily to the Jews. Mark wrote to the Greeks, particularly those in Rome, John wrote to Greek-speaking people, particularly those who were Jews and yet had not believed. So you see that from a literary viewpoint, sections of Scripture were addressed to certain individuals, certain bodies of people, certain groups of people, certain kinds of people. But there were no epistles written to like men. Or women, or children. It's quite interesting. There's something to be learned in all of this concerning the nature of salvation, the gospel. The nature of salvation, the gospel that declares the salvation, and then the epistles that expound the salvation. Those are, those are not exclusive to any person or people unless it be the body of Christ. Amen. They all take into account a common salvation, mm -hmm. as is mentioned in Scripture, Jude 1.3, and a common faith, yeah. as is mentioned in Titus 1.4. Yeah. 
So at no point is the salvation of God itself tailored for an individual. Yes. The gospel itself is never tailored for a particular church. The salvation of God is not tailored for a particular kind of people or body of people. That's why the current trend that God wants to honor your dreams you have and this sort of thing, that's why this is so wrong. This is not what's happening this day of salvation. There is an individual association of God with people, but this is not what salvation is all about. It's not about a person or a group of persons or a certain kind of persons. It's not that way. So when these letters are addressed to these people, they thought this all brings them all down to a common listening area, so to speak. It's, the scriptures, when addressed to different kinds, it's like they're all gathered in the same meeting room. And they're hearing the same message, it's just from a little different mm -hmm. perspectives because there's certain kinds of activities and sins that particularly cloud certain aspects of salvation. Like if you have an emphasis on self, there's a whole body of truth that's hidden by that emphasis. It's, right. it's like placing a dime before your eye and looking at the sun. You can't, you can't see it. So when there's correction in letters of Scripture, it's to get those obstacles out of the way so everybody can see the same thing. Mm -hmm. Amen. And uh, different type of things, obscure, like division has a particularly blinding effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carnality, it has a blinding effect. Slothfulness and lukewarmness has another kind of blinding effect. Yeah. See, so the Scriptures are all written to correct that. So as we go into this, we want to keep that in mind that Philemon is written to a person. But I will tell you that as we proceed to this book, you may think that you're Philemon. And that, of course, is how the scriptures are designed to think. <laughs> it's designed to cause you to think that when you read the book of Ephesians, for instance, we begin thinking we're like, we're the Ephesians. You know? well, that's true. That's, that's, what it's, that's what it's calculated to do, bring everybody into the same arena so that rather than the text being individualized for the person mm -hmm. the individuals are tailored for the text mm -hmm. it's a different kind of approach but I, I'm very much refreshed by it so we'll do our best to cover verse 1 tonight Paul a prisoner of Jesus Christ and Timothy our brother under Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. And I will tell you that Paul doesn't just throw out words and mm -hmm. things that build people up in the flesh. All these are very precise and sincere words. These have come from the heart. As far as the record of Scripture is concerned, there's no other person by this name, Paul. <laughs> Whenever you're Paul and you're, and you're you're speaking of scripture, there's one, yeah, right. there's one person. Mm -hmm. That word Paul is mentioned 156 times in scripture. And, none, and the gospels are excluded. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Compare, he was formerly called Saul. Compare the use of the name Paul as compared to Saul. He's referred to as Saul 25 times in Acts 7, 58 through 13, 9. That was as an enemy of the enemy of the church. And he's also mentioned called Saul in Acts 22, 7 and Acts 26, 14, where Paul is recounting his call from Jesus who said, Saul, Saul. Paul is mentioned 126 times in Acts 13, 9 through 28, 30. So a little more than half of the book of Acts is about Paul. First part of Acts is about Peter's the main person. Interesting, isn't it? Minister of the circumcision. Peter's the main person, the first part of Acts. 
And then Paul takes over and it's all about him. John is mentioned 120, 131 times with 102 of them being in the Gospels, mm -hmm. Jesus' ministry. And 29 in Acts through Revelation. They're the only two apostles that are mentioned. Peter and John are the only two apostles that are mentioned at all yeah. after Acts 1. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the 11, you, 10, 10 rather, you, you just don't read anything, hear anything about them. They were active, but they what they were saying was the same as what yeah. Peter and John were saying. So when it comes to the New Covenant era, so far as the Scripture record is concerned, the predominant man on earth was Paul the Apostle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. And that's just going by the Scripture record. Yeah. Yeah. His writings are more voluminous, 14 letters he wrote. Two Peter wrote two, John wrote four. James wrote one, Jude wrote one. But the depth and scope of Paul's writings are different than anyone else's. Yeah, yeah. And this doesn't, uh, this doesn't it infringe upon the character or ministry or disposition of the other apostles. I'm going to explain why it was this way. Why Paul is the predominant man on earth, not Peter. Because Israel had provoked God to jealousy with other gods, God said through Moses he was going to provoke them mm -hmm. to jealousy by a people that were not a people. Mm -hmm. here's, here's his words from Deuteronomy 32, 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. Mm -hmm. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, which is a scriptural term for idols, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. Paul quotes this in Romans 10.19 and Romans 11.19. That foolish nation was the Gentiles to whom Paul became an apostle. This provocation was not what the Gentiles actually attained because they dropped the ball. The provocation was that they were given an apostle that said more than the accumulative 12 said to them. That's what's going to provoke them to jealousy. I can tell you the Gentile church is never, never going to provoke the Jews to jealousy. In fact, it looks pretty stupid in their eyes. It does. Mm -hmm. But the gospel that they've been given mm -hmm. through the Apostle Paul, which is being eliminated from the modern church, yeah. uh -huh. that's what's going to provoke them to jealousy. Mm -hmm. And when it does, big things are going to start uh, to happen. See, these things that Paul was given, they were hidden to they were hidden to the Jews. They were hidden until the time when their veils left. They're going to say, whoa. Yeah. Same gospel that we heard yeah. has been kept from them by a veil. Whenever Paul spoke, see, the Jews didn't see the types, shadows, mm -hmm. prophecies of the coming Messiah. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't comprehend them. Why not? It's hid. It was hidden. That's right. It was hidden from them yeah. because they provoked God to jealousy. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something now. This is what's happened to the Gentile church. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no way mm -hmm. the Gentile church is ever going to see the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's provoked God to anger by adopting another God, another Christ, another God. By neighbor. It's closed up to them. Yeah. Now, there'll be people, I understand, individuals is going to see it just like there were individual Jews mm -hmm. yeah. that saw it. But there's, the, uh, the Gentile church is unrecoverable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a bad message, but that's, that's the way it is. And you, all you have to do is just put it to the test. Yeah. 
you'll see this is the case, that anyone in the professed church that has any discernment at all about Christ, they're the exception. Mm -hmm. They're not the rule. Amen. Exact duplication of Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were some Jews that believed. Mm -hmm. Every single person wasn't blinded. Mm -hmm. There was a remnant that believed. That's a situation we've got today. Whenever Paul spoke or wrote, it was always with what he'd been seen in mind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, as in this epistle, he'll, he'll adapt it to a very personal situation, but he always wrote with what he had been given to see, uniquely been given to see in mind. He never put that to the side mm -hmm. and come down in the plains of Ono and talk with politicians and people like that. He didn't do that, mm -hmm. not at all. So it's going to be in this uh, in this book we're going to see that. Now Paul was noted for his insight and for his prodigious work. Those two things. Once he said to the Ephesians, <clears throat> "Ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace which is given to me, to you word, that is you Gentiles word." If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me for you. Peter said of Paul's writings, even our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now Peter wrote to the scattered mm -hmm. Jews. That's Hebrews who are those Jews mm -hmm. that Paul wrote, see. Mm -hmm. As also in all his epistles, speaking to in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. He didn't say he couldn't understand them. Hard to be understood. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures, unto their own the people's destruction. So he was noted for what he knew and what he preached. It wasn't his reputation didn't follow him like people do today. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that. It was what he said. Amen. Yeah. Now, you will have to admit that there are very few preachers and teachers that you know what they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> most of the preachers in town, we have no idea what they say, yeah. mm -hmm. the message they deliver. What, what is the overriding theme of their preaching? We don't have the slightest idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not even the big mega churches, we just don't know. Why? They're not known for that. Mm -hmm. They're known for other things, their organizational skills and the number of people they've got and things like this. That's not what Paul was known for. See, that's the contrast I'm making here. And he was noted for his prodigious work. He said, I labored more abundantly than they, that's the other apostles, yeah. all. And there was 12 of them, there's one of him, and his labors outstripped yeah. the other 12. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he gave, because he had removed, he had placed a veil over the Jews' eyes, mm -hmm. and there was a limited amount of things made available to them because of that, but he put, he open the thing up to the Gentiles and that's why Paul had all this to say because God's going to use what Paul preached to provoke the Jews. Amen. So if, if you hide what Paul mm -hmm. preached, mm -hmm. you have shut up the Jews to no hope. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. They're not going to be impressed by organizational skills. Mm -hmm. They're a little bitty nation that got more organizational skills that big na of big nations have. So they're not faulty in that area. Mm -hmm. They're strong in that area. Mm -hmm. They own most of the banks of the world. Yeah. They own almost all the media, inter almost all of the communication media in the world. They own it. Mm -hmm. So they're not short in that area. They've not been blinded in how to make money mm -hmm. or how to be efficient or how to be inventive. They've been blinded in this gospel. Yeah, right. And so someday they're going to see this former Pharisee, what he'd been given to see. And when they, when they do, 
they'll be impressed with what he said and what he did. All the writing, put him in prison, he'd write. Put him on the road and he'd preach. You couldn't, you couldn't stop him from spreading the gospel. And it's finally that's going to spread over into them. Paul, this, now there's not many people that can introduce them by self by saying, I'm Paul. <laughs> Most people say so, you know. You get amazed, I say, I'm given. You got any more information you can give us? I'm Robert. Yeah. Paul didn't have that trouble, said Paul. Well, yeah, right. oh, automatically, you know who they're talking about. That's how much grace is poured out on him. Yeah. When you hear the word Paul, well, your mind is filled with all kind of things. Mm -hmm. That this isn't the case with some, I have a unique name. Mm -hmm. But you know, unless people personally know me, they, you know, well, but anyway, Paul, that's what I said. He says, uh, he doesn't say the, the apostles of the Gentiles. He could have said that, but that's not what he said here. He says, I'm a, I'm a prisoner, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It, it's I want you to know me. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Other versions say, "For the I'm a prisoner for the sake of Messiah Yeshua." It's a Jewish Bible. I'm a prisoner for preaching the good news about Jesus Christ. There's no living translation. That is that if it hadn't been for this message I preach, <laughs> I wouldn't be in. I wouldn't be in prison. I'm not in prison because I was a political insurrectionist like Barabbas. He, he, was, in, he was a Jew. He was in prison because he raised an insurrection and committed murder. So that's why he was in prison. This isn't why Paul was in prison. But Paul, in my understanding, is not referring so much to his in, incarceration as he, as he is to his apprehension by Jesus Christ. Now, Acts 12, 4 says that Herod apprehended Peter, but Jesus apprehended yeah. Saul of Tarsus. See, and I think that's what he's talking about there. I've been apprehended. I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm right in that capacity. I'm right in capacity of a slave of Jesus, a willing slave, but a slave nonetheless. Of course, that's why he was placed in prison, was because he was a slave of yeah. Jesus Christ. It's apparent that Paul doesn't think Philemon's going to think less of him because he's a prisoner. Mm -hmm. He knows who he's writing to. He, he knows that, he's, oh, so you're a prisoner. Well, if, you, if God was with you, why are you in prison? You know, this is kind of the mentality that we've got today. Uh -huh. it's a, that's not why. His condition was a confirmation of his commitment to Christ. Mm -hmm. There come a crossroad in his life when he knew, if I tone down the message or stop preaching the message, then I won't have all this trouble. Mm -hmm. But he chose to tone it up instead of tone it down, and so his imprisonment confirmed his commitment mm -hmm. to Christ. You know, Epaphroditus and Trophimus both became sick while they were working for Christ. Epaphroditus and Trophimus. They both became sick mm -hmm. while they were laboring for Christ. Some people say you're burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. Slow down. That's not what they said to these people. Right. This glorified God that someone is willing, that willing to serve God, that if it meant their health fell apart, they still served him. That shows a commitment, see, of a person. Yeah, really it doesn't really make any difference if a person's burning the candle at both ends that God gave them a really big candle. That's right. <laughs> 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 see, these early servants were willing to spend and be spent, as yeah. Paul would say, for the cause of Christ. I really won't go across the street. Let me be more specific. I will not go across the sidewalk to hear a person who's not willing to forfeit personal advantage to serve Christ. Mm -hmm. I have no interest at all in what they're saying. Yeah. It can't be very significant. 
But for someone that is willing to lay down their life, inconvenience himself, and even die for Christ, there's a message I want to hear. Yeah. Amen. That message. I, Paul, a servant, uh, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So there's two people mentioned right off the bat. Two Paul and Jesus Christ. And it's in that context he's going to talk Paul and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head. Paul is the, is the member. And then he mentions and, and. Now, if you say Paul and, you, you, you know that the person he mentions is, is not a nobody. Paul and, you know. Father and the son. You know. <laughs> Paul and Silas, yeah. Peter and John. See, there's a lot of those ands. There's a significant person after that. Paul and Timothy. Timothy. He's mentioned 24 times in Scripture, usually the name Timothy, seven times, and Timotheus, 17 times. Timotheus is a transliteration, letter for letter, of the Greek word. I've searched, I can't find any answer that satisfied me as to why they're both, the, the word is the same word, translated Timothy, Timotheus. I can't find any satisfactory answer for why that condition existed. There, there may be one, but I couldn't find it, so I won't pursue it anymore. Talking about the same person, the meaning is the same. Tim, Timothy or Timotheus means honoring to God. Or Strong says, dear to God. Or Hitchcock's name definition says, honor of God and valued to God, while Easton's Bible Dictionary says, honoring to God. So it all kind of gives you the same idea. God was, this name means God is honored by this man. That's something to say, isn't it? God is honored. Wherever this man is known, God is honored. The response of people to this person is really their response to God. They honor God, whether it's by opposing him or receiving him, honoring to God. This is a man we're talking about. We're not talking about an angel. This is a man we're talking about. It's not an apostle we're talking about. Timothy, honoring to God. Timothy himself brought honor to God. Therefore, he was honored by God. I gather from this that when he was born, his mother must have perceived he was not an ordinary child like Jacob had perceived Moses. Okay. This is no ordinary child. It must have been that way. She must have known. His mother must have known. This is no ordinary child. That's why they poured themselves out, see? To him. Apparently, when he was a young man, Timothy, apparently before his mature years, Paul was taking a tour. He came to Lystra and Iconium. And here's what it says about Timothy. He was well reported of by the brethren in Lystra and Iconium. And it's like we have a 16 or maybe 11, maybe 12-year-old boy, 13-year-old boy. Got him in our midst, and some folk in Galena have heard about him. Brother in Springfield heard about him. They heard about this young man. In the context of his faith and knowledge of Scripture and so forth, they heard about him. And Paul uh, determined to take him with him on his own mission trip. Took this, he probably was a boy, older boy, to, to take him. I must say, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Mama Lois says, let's check this man out here. Oh, this is Paul. <laughs> now, a good name is to be desired above silver and gold. Solomon said that. If your name means something, people will trust you. If you got a bad name, people won't. Mm -hmm. And your name's shaped by what you do and what you say. That mm -hmm. builds the concept of what your name is. So it seemed to me that they knew it's safe. You could be safe in the hands of Paul. And Paul, 
The mission they're on is they're delivering the letters that the churches, elders, and apostles had written up about the Gentiles not being bound to have circumcision and how they wrote letters to the churches. And what they're doing on this trip, they're delivering these letters to the Gentile churches. And Paul takes Timothy. Well, that's, that's good training, isn't it? When it came to kingdom labors, Paul referred to Timothy, he says, he's like-minded. I mean, he thinks just like I think. Some commendation. And he could be counted on to naturally care for the condition of God's people. You didn't have to sit him down and say, now here's, here's the way you ought to respond to this. He just, he, he, could, he knew how to care for God's people, care about it. Now we've got some people like this among us. You want to be able to recognize who they are. He had the same kind of care Paul said. He said he had that which cometh on me daily, the care. Yeah, Timothy had that. He had that concern. See, there are some people among us, they are like concerned about the state of the churches. There are some people, they don't, they don't see it that clear yet. So they don't spend any sleepless nights because of the churches. They don't have any long prayer sessions because of the churches. But there are some people, like Timothy, who are like-minded, that they stay awake at night thinking about these churches. Like-minded, as Timothy. When it came to a, his concern for the churches in uh, Lystra and Iconium in which he lived, Paul would count him to have a keen interest in the stability of the churches. He was raised up, knowledgeable of Scripture, he was raised up so he would have a mutual concern for the churches. And he no doubt would pick up on this. He probably wasn't aware of this circumstance where some Jews said said it's safe to be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you can't be saved. He probably wasn't aware of those circumstances that happened in Acts 15. But Paul knew he'll be able to pick up on this right away and be discerning. Paul sent Timothy uh, to other churches to stabilize them. How's that? We've got we've got some brethren that I think we can do this with now. You can send them, they can stabilize. They can identify what the difficulty is and stabilize the church and comfort them. Timothy was that kind of person. Everybody's not like this. We all know this. Everybody's not like this, but there can be people like that, like Timothy, who was rather young. And yet he had this uh, ability. Certain prophecies have been pronounced over Timothy. Paul refers to them. Prophecies that were printed over him. And he said, by them, these prophecies, by them, that thou might, by them, mightest wage a good warfare. War a good warfare. How's that? Just? So there are prophecies that make a good fighter, good kingdom fighter out of Timothy. It wasn't like, you're going to have success, and I see you down the road. You're going to have all your f needs met, and it wasn't that sort of thing. It was a kind of prophecy that made him know he was going to be more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, and he could wage a good warfare by these prophecies that were given upon him. Now, I suggest that this is good for us to be open to this type of thing, that as we progress in the Lord, there'll be times when It'll come to certain brethren, they'll, they'll be able to pronounce like a word about a person, like Timothy. What is, God will speak to them and kind of shape and direct this person where, how he shapes his life. I had an experience like this when I was young. I didn't know this as fully as I do now, but when I was ordained... I was uh, 18 years old, and there were some men that pronounced what I look back on now. They were 
these kind of prophecies. They pronounced what they felt I would do and what I should do and this sort of thing. And as I look back on it, I, I think that happened to a major, at least, to myself. And Paul, uh, he had Timothy circumcised because of the Jews in the quarters because they all knew his father was a Greek and he was like a half-breed. <laughs> he wasn't like a 100% Jew. So just so the people would know, Timothy wasn't a reactionary yeah. against Judaism. He had T Timothy circumcised. He refused to circumcise Titus. Mm -hmm. The Jews tried to pressure him to circumcise Titus, and he refused to do it. But he wasn't pressure here. This was an accommodation. So as they went on their ministry, speaking to the churches, there'd be no kind of reproach in the synagogue where they went to some synagogue where the brethren were meeting there'd be Jews there and he, he didn't want to be offended so Timothy consents to this he's not like a baby when this is done <laughs> he's a young adult but he didn't say wait a minute I didn't, wait. <laughs> I didn't know this was involved in other well, people do this today they're gung-ho about serving God until they hear what has to be done, and then uh, I'm not sure I want to do it, but T. Timothy wasn't that way. He had the same mind and the same judgment Timothy did. That's something believers are admonished to have, be of the same mind and the same judgment. Amen. All right, Timothy was. Mm -hmm. He did have the same mind and the same judgment. Paul and Timothy were so closely knit together that when he wrote this letter, he said, this is from myself and Timothy. Mm -hmm. we, this is, this is the expression of both our hearts and minds. Paul and Timothy. See, Babylon is so neutered, the professed church, that this kind of closeness is virtually unknown. Yeah. Virtually unknown. There's some among us who have preached for some time, and they know that they think back there were whole periods of time they didn't have one person that was like-minded with them. Whole, whole periods of their life, they didn't have one person who could, was, their thinking was in sync with them. Mm -hmm. Timothy, he wasn't like that. His mind was in sync. See, they had the unity of the faith. Some people talk about unity of the faith. Paul and Timothy had unity of the faith and the unity of the spirit. In intercessory prayer on the eve of his betrayal, Jesus made it clear that the world will not believe who he is until the disciples of Christ are correctly and properly united. Here's what he prayed. And the glory which thou, hast given, which thou gavest me, I have given them that, th that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me. See, nobody of believers can ignore this word. There have been literally billions of dollars spent on missions. It's staggering. No, I don't know of anyone who has been able to accurately estimate. And the world is growing worse. Why? No unity. There's division in the ranks. And God forbids mm -hmm. the world to believe until his people are one. Yeah. It will not happen. Mm -hmm. That's why there's going to be another catalyst. The Gentiles can't be the catalyst to this. We've had, right. we've had a couple thousand years to work on. And we Gentiles haven't done it. But when the veil is lifted mm -hmm. from the Jews, they'll have this unity. And the world will believe yeah. that Jesus came out from God. <laughs> oh, I love to ponder it. Yes, go ahead. Condemnation much greater for the Gentiles. Oh yes. Than what it was for the oh, Jews. Yes. Now the Jews. They, I was thinking about this while you were speaking. They have a prophecy. Paul prophesied yeah. about the <laughs> we don't. veil being lifted. There's a prophecy connected there, and, and even in the prophets, all he'll turn away iniquity from Jacob. Yeah. So there are all these prophecies. But there is no prophecy That's that right. the Gentile church is going to be recovered. That's right. <laughs> I know it. 
But yeah, they, the but it'll be converted. Well, the t when the time of the Gentiles comes. Yeah, the time of the yeah, Gentiles. Oh yeah, that's yeah. What you say? Yeah, yeah there is a time when it's going to end. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, as Paul and Timothy, that mm -hmm. just when you hear our names, mm -hmm. be a lot of the, well, you experienced, didn't you experience it when you heard Paul, Timothy, just a whole, mm -hmm. whole lot of things come to your mind now. Now, we admonish you to live in such a manner so that when someone repeats your name to us, oh, yeah. all these good things, your good fight of faith, your consistency, your deliberateness, it all comes to mind. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's unto you, Philemon. Word Philemon means affectionate or friendly. We understand he was from Colossae. Because Archippus is mentioned in Philemon, and Archippus is said to be from Colossae in Colossians 4.17. Mm -hmm. And he probably, was, Archippus was probably ministering to the Colossians at that time. Putting this together with the fact that Philemon had a church in his house, as verse 2 says, and that Philemon probably was a well-to-do person that the first the, che the letter seems to indicate he was a well uh, supplied man because he said they have love toward all the saints and lived it out. Yeah. It's probably the church at Colossae probably met in his abode where he was. <laughs> and everything we know about Philemon is in this letter. We don't know anything. <laughs> We don't, nothing, nothing else, no other source of understanding. He probably was like in a role of a pastor, teacher type mm -hmm. person. I said, dearly beloved, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved. See, the love of the brethren exudes from Paul's letters. He mentions things like this uh, quite a bit, frequent references to them. He referred to the Philippians as Dearly beloved and longed for. There's some people, now tell me the truth, there's some people you don't long for. Yeah. Uh -huh. You don't long to be with them, and you long for their conversion, I understand that, but you don't uh, long to be with them. He said to them, how greatly I long after you all. I see that. He wrote to the Romans, I long to see you. He referred to the Romans as dearly beloved, as well as the Corinthians and Timothy. Tychicus was a beloved brother, as well as Onesimus and Luke. <laughs> the Colossians were addressed as holy and beloved. The Thessalonians were called beloved. The Hebrews were called that as well, beloved. See, so this exudes from this love for the brethren. This exudes from his letters. Dearly beloved, dearly beloved. Now, there's an in t increased intensity in these words, in these expressions. There's beloved, all right? That separates from the normal love. There's mm -hmm. dearly beloved, all right? Now we've stepped up a notch. Yeah. There's dearly beloved and longed for. Now we're, that's, that's intense more. See, the love of the brethren tends to increase. Amen. That's right. It's not like a fixed quantity that you get in your hand. It, it, it grows. It increases. Beloved, precious, dearly beloved, really close to my heart. Dearly beloved and long for, I want to be with you. See, that's how brotherly love is. It's like all these are the same gender, mm -hmm. but they are in intensified measures of it. For instance, John is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He did, it doesn't mean he didn't love the other disciples, but this was an ex extra, extraordinary love. I gather because of his sensitivity. Again, it said of the Lord Jesus, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. As it compared to the multitudes, compared to the rest of the Jews, compared to Jerusalem, compared to those in the temple, he, especially, he loved his own. His especially... He's not thinking about the world Amen. when he drew near to his death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's thinking about those he loved. Mm -hmm. 
He thought about the world before, and he thought about the world after he rose from the dead. But when he come to that cross, he loved his own. Why he didn't want them to be caught all away in all of, by all of this. Yeah. Time to the end. Even emphasized to the disciples the Father's unique love toward them. John 16, 27. Yeah, I'm commenting on dearly beloved. Now, this is an unusual type love. For the Father himself loveth you, said to the disciples. The Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. So there's a special place in God's heart for people that love Jesus Amen. and believed he came out from God. Yeah. Oh, God has... A... Mm -hmm. Now, it's good that we tell people this. See, the others are telling the world God loves everybody. But here's what Jesus, now this is Jesus, this is God manifest in the flesh. If ever there was a time to say God loves everybody, this would have been the time, but that's not what he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, the Father loves you because you love me and believed I came out from God. So when you find a person mm -hmm. who loves Jesus and believes he came out from God, tell him the Father loves you Amen. because... You love Jesus and believe he came out from God. And it, oh, it'll do something for their heart. Believe me. This kind of love Paul expressed for Timothy, he said, I have, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your estate. Now, he touched with a lot of people. It didn't mean everybody else were reprobates. It just mean Timothy excels, so there's, there's some things he could only tell Timothy some cares and concerns. He, he could only tell Timothy because he'd react in the right way. Now he says, uh, Philemon is one of those. Mm -hmm. He dearly beloved. He calls him a fellow laborer. Remember, Paul's in prison. Philemon's in Colossae. Fellow laborer. In other versions say fellow worker or co-worker or dear helper in the faith, fellow workman, sharer with us in the work. A fellow laborer, this doesn't mean like someone that has a job. <laughs> this is not what this means. It denotes a status that finds people working on the same project. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a fellow worker that's working on the same yeah. project. Yeah. Workers together with God. They're truly fellow laborers and co-workers. For example, there are many Christian ministers and educators and religious workers in our city. But I couldn't call them laborers or co-laborers. Mm -hmm. Laborers together. Yeah. Fellow workers. Because they're not doing what we're doing. Yes, right. yeah. We don't have to be ashamed about this. This is just the way it is. Fellow laborer working on the same mm -hmm. project. When we find someone's working on the same project, they're doing the same things. Mm -hmm. We're speaking generally now, establishing people in the faith, mm -hmm. building them up in the faith, mm -hmm. enhancing their hope, contributing to their peace. When we find people doing this, they're a fellow laborer. Amen. That's what they are, fellow laborer. Now, labor, valid labor, is in the context of fervent love and work. Mm -hmm. that, that is, it's, it's our activity that knits us together. Yeah. Amen. You, see? <laughs> yeah. right. you can talk about love one another, love one another, love one another, but if we're now working together, that's going to be hard to do. It is. And I say that knowing that there's a lot of explanation probably that should be given, but you can work that out yourself. But I will tell you, the more we work together, the more we're fellow laboring together, the more we love each other. That's what knits us together to the glory of God. Such a body not only speaks the truth, they're laboring together. Not only speaks the truth, they speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and the church is edified, edifies itself in love. Yeah, that's See, right. that's what happens when you're working together. But if you have a body of people that aren't working together, loving one another is a hollow sound. Mm -hmm. Technically, it ought to be done. But see, that kind of love is developed in the context of mm -hmm. laboring together, mm -hmm. being a fellow laborer. Yes? Well, we see this, too, in this scripture that you've already brought out in John 17, 22 to yeah. through 23, about the Father and the right. Son being one and us being one. So so when we labor together and we grow in this, it's like we're, we're just uniting in one with the Lord. And this love is going to continue to grow. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. we've experienced this this last weekend. We mm -hmm. actually experienced this. Now, didn't we feel especially close to each other yeah. when we were laboring together in this? Mm -hmm. we, see, we snatched a soul out of the burning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the devil was trying to get. Right. And fortunately, mm -hmm. the, the brother knew that. Yeah came for help we rallied together yeah. mm -hmm. and we'll find that knit us together yeah. Amen. more tightly see mm -hmm. so when paul says to philemon fellow laborer mm -hmm. that's the thing that made them close close together yeah. was their labors now today we've got babylon is doing something different they, t they want to do a certain work, and so they sequester the people off, right? Yeah. They isolate this body of people that are doing something special. They isolate them off from the other people to do that, mm -hmm. to do that work. Then they try, they, they go back to the group if they need finances or something like that, though. Mm -hmm. But this philosophy is wrong. Yeah. This is not right. I understand that there's some things that the people couldn't do through the church, but they just were with the wrong group of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. These people that have ministries, and they're, I don't question the validity of the ministries, mm -hmm. they should gather together with people that have a heart for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. They wouldn't have to go out and ask other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, they wouldn't. This is how the kingdom of God works. Why? Because as you work together, mm -hmm. you're knit together yeah. more close, closely. Because he work, mm -hmm. working together involves expression mm -hmm. and outflow from you. Yeah. We work to, we're contributing. See, we're, right. we're contributing so in some way. We're contributing. And as we contribute to the common work, mm -hmm. we are knit Amen. together. So as he says, Philemon... But dearly beloved and fellow laborer, he sets the context. Philemon, I'm writing to you as someone who's engaged in the work. Mm -hmm. The broad description of the work is Jesus is building his church. Mm -hmm. Yes? There, there on that thought, being a fellow worker or a co laborer together, mm -hmm. you're not just working in proximity to each other, yeah. each man doing mm -hmm. his own thing. This co-laboring is a blending of effort. That's good, that's good. It's uh, being supported and supporting mm -hmm. so that you're, uh, you're like moving mm -hmm. in the same direction for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. And that does cause uh, a sense of unitedness yes. and, Amen. and oneness. Yeah. One that uh, yeah. you depend on and mm -hmm. one that the others depend on. Yes. Amen. Yeah, we we've all experienced this too, and, and, uh, at the renewal and at these yeah. um these um preaching festivals where we all we all have a common theme and we're all laboring together in, in the understanding of this theme. Uh, technically, it's all about the scriptures, but it's more precise yeah. at these meetings. We we like labor together. And you can see how profitable, when you look back on, on, on the renewals, it just in particular, on the different subjects that have been brought up and how your understanding, it's like it, it grew in leaps and bounds. Yeah. Where you couldn't have done that on your own, or even one assembly could, couldn't have done it. But it's just an example of the whole body in, that we know anyway in this nation coming together, and um, it's produced something. Amen. And you notice at the end of those meetings, how we hate to leave each yes, other. Yes, amen. Go ahead, Brother Tony. God, God 
to be fellow laborers yeah. with, with the laboring, the emphasis on laboring. Yes, but you've good. got to be of the same mind Amen. in judgment yeah. if you're going to profit That's right. to that end. Amen. And uh, this is it's good. You know, it's remarkable how now God, he did this mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. How he surrounded Paul with these kind of brethren. That's right. That each, like Timothy, for example, I was thinking when you died, he was a special. He was up there. Yeah. He was uh, like second, you know, like an, yeah. his assistant. Yeah. yeah. But then he was surrounded by a cluster of brethren yeah. who were fellow laborers, so he mm -hmm. could depend on them. Remember same he, mind and judgment. When he was on the way to Rome, he even stopped off with some brethren, mm -hmm. strengthened yeah. them. They were co laborers. Oh, yeah. They Amen. were fellow laborers. <laughs> mm hmm. Amen. Anyone else tonight have something? Amen. Everybody can see this all right? Yes. Brother Amen. Matthew? Yeah, I appreciate what you said at the beginning about uh, the, the manner of Paul's writings is that he doesn't capitalize on distinctions that are going to pass away with the world. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Amen. 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 Well, that's, uh, that's the prelude. We'll get into Philemon now, but... Uh, I, I could have done better at this, but I want what I wanted you to see is that before the productive work is done, mm -hmm. the association with not one another has to be like yeah. cleared up and enhanced. Amen. Because what we're doing requires more than my hands or your hands. Amen. Yeah. Everybody's hands have to be on. Uh, Nehemiah couldn't build a wall himself. So he made sure that only the people with a kindred heart worked on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Amen. But that that working on that wall united those brethren and made them more precious to each yes. other. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, Brother Tony. I observed this particularly. I was able to observe this. I've heard a, a lot. But you know now what Brother Mark needed. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of brethren couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it really, it really yeah. was necessary yeah. for a lot of different perspectives mm -hmm. right. of salvation That's right. for him to come mm -hmm. to, to hear from that and observe it and see yeah. it and, and actually see mm -hmm. the body working together. It, this is what he needed yeah. uh, in a situation like that. I'm praying that this will, this type of thing will increase more and more because there are people from around the country that. Their whole lives would be changed just by spending a weekend with us. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And some people, they don't believe something like this is, it just seems too good to be true. Mm -hmm. But this is traceable to the fact that we've grown together and we've advanced together and we all pretty much have a, the same mind. You know, none of us are kicking against the gold, so yeah. to speak. And this creates an environment in which Christ can minister, see? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. Uh, concerning this, uh, the body working together, each one, we're members in particular. In particular. But that's different mm -hmm. than being individuals. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Members in particular means that you have been given uh, certain uh, abilities and gifts for using within the context yeah. of the whole. Yeah, amen. And actually, it makes each of us selfless when it comes to the brethren. Mm -hmm. It makes us um, more, more aware of Christ and, and what He wants, and then, as a result, more mindful of the needs of the brethren mm -hmm. than a, a holding ourselves separate and a part of the group. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds simple, but if you have a, 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 an assembly and you even have one or two people that really don't see themselves as members in particular mm -hmm. of the whole, yeah. that has a very, um, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it introduces a, a conflict, if you will, yes, it of does. sorts. It may not be like a sharp one. One that, that uh, promotes uh, dissension or or arguing, but it's a weak point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Amen. a place where where Satan, I'm sure, lingers about mm -hmm. for an opportunity to open itself mm -hmm. because it's it's kind of like a, a cut in your skin mm -hmm. where yeah. where things can come in and affect. Yeah, it's a it's a jeopardy. 
-hmm. for people to hold themselves as individual amongst the rest of them. Because see, there's where there's where that concept of I resides, yeah. mm -hmm. as a as opposed to Christ, and we are we, we are of mm -hmm. Him. I, just, I won't linger on this, but just in your mind, go over uh, last Lord's Day, and we had someone open up the meeting with the word. We had someone lead us in certain kind of songs. We had someone lead us in certain quoting the scripture. We had someone lead us in a thought and calling. We in all of these we had a message. We had a discussions. We had an exhortation. But in all of that, we were laboring together. And some of you have noticed that it almost sometimes it sounds like we planned the thing out. All talk, but we didn't. It was planned out, but not by us. That's what laboring together, that's what that is, see. We were working on the same project. And what happened? We became closer to each other, Brother Matt. Testify to this. When, we were, when I went over to um, Brother Tony's to have dinner with him, we were talking about him about something. He said, "Yeah, Brother Gibbon was just talking about that same thing. And he was talking <laughs> about the, the same text, but from a different perspective. So we were all kind of working together to That's right. aid him along in his understanding." Yeah. Amen. Well, anyway, the whole thing is quite marvelous, and Amen. we'll see it lived out in Book of Philemon. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the very reality of lab fellow laborers. I can speak for myself and for a great number of other brethren that we have no idea where we would be, where we would be if there were not fellow laborers and those knit together in love. We thank you for this marvelous uh, blessing that we've received. We pray that you would Assist us to grow in it and be a bright and shining light of this. In Jesus' name, amen.